4,000 years ago. Give or take a few hundred years. And 2,000 years. After the British mainland separated from Europe. A people lived in this place I called Orkney. They were a hardy breed, and their houses and monuments are still there today. They knew of the power of ideas. They knew they were not the first to have the power of ideas. They knew of an idea, which had preceded all of their history. An idea from before history itself. An idea that preceded the manifestation of time and space. An idea that might have taken part in the creation of everything. Far-fetched. Around 350 BC or 2700 years later, Plato believed, and many others agreed with him, that the universe was created. Abinitio, from abstract entities. We now call ideas. These ideas were eternal and everlasting. And existed before time and space existed. There are countless infinities of these so-called ideas. The most primitive idea that Plato believed had form was a fiery matter constructor called a regular tetrahedron. It is the first of the four platonic solids relating to fire, air, earth, and water. This is a journey through time accompanied by Plato's idea. From Neolithic Britain to the present time, I have dabbled in creating substance from ideas alone, with the help of the giant of thought, and its manifestation in the computer programs. Open card and their language 3D. I present this video to my friends, especially the sculptor of ideas at SusanCampBillimages.co.uk, in the hope that I can persuade them all that ideas are more powerful than things. The recent Olympic Games opening and closing ceremonies showed this. I think London won all the gold medals awarded for showing the world the power of idea. Vincent Omnia Meritus. Truth conquers all. And I'm a Vincent Omnia. Love conquers all. These are two that I mention that continue to be important ideas. Partially encompassed by the Olympic movement. And I hope are refined in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil with Order me progresso, order and progress. I will now ask Professor the Monuments at the heart of Neolithic Orkney. And Scarabray proclaim the triumphs of the human spirit in early ages and isolated places. They were approximately contemporary with the master mass of the archaic period of Egypt. In the first and second dynasties, the brick temples of Samaria and the first cities of the Harappa culture in India, earlier than the golden age of China. These sites stand as a visible symbol of the achievements of early peoples. The Ring of Brodka is the finest known truly circular late Neolithic stone ring and a later expression of the spirit which gave rise to Mies Howe, Stennis and Scarabray. The first survey of the Ring of Brodka was in 1849 by Royal Navy Captain F.W.L. Thomas who was drawing up Admiralty charts in 1849. He published in 1852, The Celtic Antiquities of Orkney, excavations by Orkney College, at the nearby Ness of Brodka site, between the ring and the stones of Stennis, have uncovered several buildings, both ritual and domestic, pottery, bones, stone tools, and a polished stone mace head, have been discovered. The most important find, is the remains of a large stone wall which may have been 100 meters, 330 feet long, and up to 6 meters, 20 feet wide, across the entire peninsula. The site may have been a symbolic barrier, the ring, and the world around it. Invaders from Scandinavia reached Orkney, by the 9th century, bringing a complex theology, that they imposed on the pre-existing Orcadian monuments, at least according to local legend. Not for example, the Ring of Brodka, and the Standing Stones of Stennis, known as the Temple of the Sun and Moon. Young people supposedly made their vows, and prayed to Woden at these temples, and at the so-called Odin Stone, that lay between the stone circles. Several of the stones at Brodka, contain runic carvings that were left, by Nordic peoples. Archaeologists notes that the diameter, of the bank at Brodka, is almost exactly 175 megalithic yards, the same as the inner banks of the Avery in England and Newgrange in Ireland. The so-called megalithic yard at 0.8297 meters 2.722 feet per megalithic yard is a controversial measure originally proposed by Alexander Thom. Thom's thesis, based on a statistical analysis of the Neolithic monuments in the United Kingdom, 
is that the builders of these sites employed a common unit of measurement, implying a transfer of information that may not have existed, even if it were possible. Ewan Mackay suggested that the nearby village of Scarabray might be the home of a privileged theocratic class of wise men who engaged in astronomical and magical ceremonies at sites like Brodka and Stennus. A Neolithic low road connects Scarabri with the chambered tomb of Misho. Passing near Brodka and Stennus, low roads connect Neolithic ceremonial sites throughout Britain. That is enough of that tosh, Sir Eagle. Let's move on to what these people did in later life. David Ockham will now give his stream of consciousness take on oscillations, and he used the power of ideas to revolutionize. The other thing that the Neolithic man needed, communications. I was reminded of the extremely rapid development of the building blocks of this on my visit to the Radio Museum in Kirkwall. Here this Neolithic man was returned to a child. A child of a change of the physical to the metaphysical. The physical represented the industrial, chemical military horror of the early part of the 20th century. The ethereal and metaphysical is the new domain of ideas. For the first time I see again my Michael Moustache mask that I wore as a two-year-old under the stairwell when the sirens wailed in Aberdeen. It was returned to the government in 1945 for possible reuse. The best reuse is showing it here. The crystal sets powered from the invisible energy around us. We prospected on the micro mountains of Galana crystals with a cat's whisker. Looking for a good spot. We had each discovered a semiconductor junction diode. We loved the progress of the unmovable. Encased in glass manufactured ones ones. Made of a different crystal. Germanium. I built a computer of these to play knots and crosses. Or tic-tac-toe in America. But I became bored when I realized that it was just an enumeration of all the possible games. And it had no future. We longed for valves. Even one valves. But the Laclan CHE cells that laboriously heated. The electron emitting cathodes soon ran out. The physical size of the valves. The inductance and capacitance of the associated circuits. Which we twiddled on with the crystal sets. Limited the maximum speed that the valve could operate at. Wavelengths of 3 meters. Were considered short in 1939. Or 100 megacycles per second. Or one tenth of a gigahertz in today's computer parlance. It is appropriate to talk of computers. Because they are themselves in essence. Communications devices. Both internally and externally. By 1942. By combining the capacitance and inductance of the surrounding resonating circuits into the immediate environment of the valve itself, wavelengths of 10 centimeters or 3 gigahertz. This allowed the so called centimetric radar, the breakthrough by Harry Brook and John Randall in Birmingham in 1940, of the cavity magnetron. Shown here, I was said to be the most important cargo ever brought to the shores of the United States. It could produce 10 kilowatts of pulsed power. At 10 centimeters wavelengths, centimetric radar was born. By the end of the war in 1945, these magnetrons could produce 2 megawatts of power at 8.7 millimeter wavelength for the then top secret millimetric radars that are still used today. After the war, magnetrons were used in civilian radar and microwave ovens, and it is estimated that 90% of American households own a microwave oven. They all descended from the 1189 model number 12 shown here. The transistor, which superseded valves, in all but a few specialist applications, was a development of the technology of the lead sulfide gale and diode of the crystal sets. We were all semiconductor pioneers then. The germanium diode, which was an important device in its own right, for the important task of signal rectification, it could not amplify. Enter the transistor. It was like two germanium point contact diodes ganged together. My first was the Mallard OC71. It was a glass encased point contact positive negative positive germanium transistor. We scraped the paint on the case and made it a photoelectric effect detector. This was a PNP device. The complementary NPN devices were available in the US but never appeared anywhere else. The US based practical electronics was always given great designs including NPN for push pull amplifiers, but we could not get the parts. The development of this essentially low power device into today's silicon chips. 
the first silicon transistor needed the arcane skills of crystal brewing to be developed. This skill was one of the pet areas of interest of my physics professor at Aberdeen University, the great man himself, Professor R. V. Jones. And in 1960, the first modern transistor was built. The computer then really took off. They may have used this mechanical computer or advanced slide rule to calculate the tides or do some difficult calculations. But I am going to use a fast desktop computer with six processors and 16 gigabytes of memory to show you the power of Plato and his idea of four triangles making up a primitive solid. Everything that you see in modern computer graphics is built from such primitives. I did not mean to make this video. I just thought that I would interest my friends in the use of the more up-to-date techniques that are being used today. I am not an expert. I did not know how to use the WINS program. It was the first time I used it. The meshes provided gave me a beautiful accurate model of a wartime Spitfire. I did not want to spoil it so I tried to use the primitives provided. I chose a tetrahedron in the center. Then I chose a spiral around the center. Then I chose a mesh provided that looked like a ball. This immediately reminded me of graphics of the Thevades virus. I matched them visually. I now played with the sculpting magnets. Both attracting and repelling of variable strength. Michelangelo didn't have these. That allowed me to distort the parts of the mesh as you can see. I then entered the AIDS like ball. And look for my tetrahedron. But IT has become so small that I cannot see IT. But I have near infinite. You can see Plato in the clear regular equilateral triangle centered on the micrograph of the thin virus. Does it go into the center in the form of an equilateral tetrahedron? Platonic shapes form the basis of myriads of organisms. Too small for us to even imagine. I then enter the AIDS like ball and look for my tetrahedron. But IT has become so small that I cannot see IT. But I have near infinite powers of magnification. And I find IT and enlarge IT until IT lives again. I then enter the AIDS like ball and look for my tetrahedron. But IT has become so small that I cannot see IT. But I have near infinite powers of magnification. And I find IT and enlarge IT until IT lives again. The process of manipulation of the facets of the graphical models is now the work directly or indirectly of millions of people who do not care about the nature of what ideas make their work possible. And why should they you ask? Well, it's like this. If you do not know what is and by that I mean what exists and is the natural philosopher's current way of doing things as implemented by us at this time. Then you will fall into a new dark age of ignorance controlled by a few ruthless governments and corporations intent on exploiting for themselves our joint knowledge. Why didn't since before Neolithic times the power of ideas? Okay, Sir Giggle, that is enough of that. Now Jimmy Botham will talk about Chambered cairns in the Black Isle and Orkney, by far the majority of the surviving chambered cairns in the Black Isle, lie near the summit of the Milbury, the rounded sandstone ridge which 
forms the backbone of the peninsula. Situated approximately at its center. Point is Mount Eagle, 838 feet. And the ridge falls away gradually towards each end. The bulk of the cairns lie at heights of 400 feet to 600 feet above. Except in at Kilcoy. Chambered cairns of the Clava group are not found in the same region as cairns of the Orkney Chromatic group. What is the reason for the exception here? Secondly, no other horned or kidney-shaped cairn is known in the Black Isle, or for that matter nearer to it than the Hebrides, Caithness, or Northern Sutherland. The bipartite chamber, the cairns of the Orkney Chromatic group are characterized by a more or less rectangular chamber, divided into compartments by pairs of oppositely placed transverse slabs. The number of compartments range from one as at a shade, and both up to as many as 28 at the Noah of Ramsey. In general the round cairns of simple construction with two compartments occur on the Scottish mainland, and we may instance Torbal and a Chani in Sutherland, which are both enclosed like can glass in a round cairn. To these may well be added the ruined or incompletely exposed chambers at Contin Mains, Balachneko, Lower Lechanish, Balnagui, Muir of Conan, Balved, Midbury, and Woodhead, all in Easter Ross. The short horned cairn of Garrywin in Caithness has a bipartite chamber, as does Kenny's cairn, although the latter possesses a lateral cell in addition. In Caithness, the predominating chamber form is tripartite. But even here, if we are to judge by the surviving roofed example at Camster, the outermost compartment was lintled and became in effect merely an extension of the passage. The corbelled roof covered the two innermost compartments only, giving the effect of a bipartite chamber. Sir John Randall's chamber was octopartite. 